All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the April 8th, 2020 town hall meeting specific to the status of food distribution in response to Governor Whitmer's Executive Order 2020-35. My name is Diane Golzinski. I am your State Child Nutrition Director for the State of Michigan. I will be your host today. We will continue to hold webinars on Wednesday afternoons to answer your questions and to address your concerns as you have them and to keep you up to date with the latest developments on our end. You will notice that we are trying Zoom as our platform today. All participants have been muted upon entry to this webinar and this webinar is being recorded. Should we experience a Zoom bombing incident, we will immediately end the webinar. Please use the chat box to provide any questions you would like to have answered and please shut all video off. We will do our best to get to all questions in the time that we have available. If we do not get to your questions, please contact us at mde-schoolnutrition at michigan.gov and we will respond as soon as possible. Section two, part B, line 10 of the executive order 2020-35 states, all public school districts, including public school academies, must provide or arrange for continuation of food distribution to eligible pupils. This means that every public school district or public school academy must provide a plan that outlines how they are taking an active role in assuring families in need are receiving food until the end of your scheduled school year. Until the end of the scheduled school year, unanticipated school closure, summer food service program remains in place. For those of you already participating, you don't need to make any changes unless you feel you need to. For those of you not currently participating, please call your school meals analyst and we will help you to get started. After the end of your scheduled school year, if you qualify for the summer food service program, you will begin regular summer food service or traditional summer food service. Those applications are now available and are due May 1st. Many of you have reached out to us with concerns about continuing to offer meals during this pandemic. It is important that as you write your plans that are due to your ISD under this executive order, that you take the following considerations into account. What is your staffing capacity? Do you have staff refusing to come in? Do you have staff who have tested positive? Consider alternatives. For example, in Escanaba, the food service staff come in on one day to prepare the food and then teachers, administrators, and other volunteers come in the next day to distribute the food. In all cases, when you are struggling to have the person power to get meals out to those in need, please contact your county emergency manager for assistance. These emergency managers need to know where you are struggling so they can provide you with the assistance you need. This is what they are trained for and the type of assistance they can provide. So please do call them. Maybe you have issues with your storage capacity. Fresh milk storage is a big issue for many districts. This doesn't mean that you stop serving milk. It may mean that you have to prepare fewer meals or offer a different distribution model. Milk is a required component and critical to the nutrition value of meals during a public health crisis. I've heard stories of coolers being brought in from other buildings and plugged in in hallways and in gyms to help keep the food cold. This is where thinking outside the box really comes in handy. Or maybe your struggle is with your distribution capacity. 
Maybe you have cars lined up for miles and you run out of food before the end of the line. It's important to remember that you can only do what you can do. If you can, increase the number of locations or the number of days you are distributing. Maybe consider bus routes if you haven't before. Again, work with your county emergency manager for additional ideas and assistance. In all cases, do what you can, but remember it can't be only on your shoulders. So how are we doing with the meals that have been served so far? As of yesterday, we had approximately set 27% of our sponsors reporting their meal service numbers. From those claims, we know that over 1.3 million breakfasts and lunch, lunches have been served. Please note, we do know that there is a glitch in our map and some sites are not showing up correctly, even after having updated information on the intake form. We are currently working to fix this issue. From the sites on the map to the stories you tell us, through these webinars, emails, social media posts, and text messages, we know that the number is significantly higher. While we also know that numbers will not likely reach those of a normal National School Lunch Program month. We are still extremely proud and thankful for all you have done and will continue to do to be a part of the solution for your community. For that, we thank you. So what about that unanticipated school closure intake form? For the remainder of this scheduled school year, you should update your form if you add a site. And please be sure you add with the full address and zip code so that we can get it on the map as soon as possible. You should update the form if you change times of meal service, making sure you add both beginning and ending times. Please note that your days of service should be listed under the additional information portion. You should also update the form if you are changing the end date of your meal service. For any who are currently listed with an end date of April 13th, MDE staff will go through and change all of those ending dates to June 1st for you. In all cases, please be sure to submit the form and not just click on save and close out. It's really important that you submit the form. So if you are wondering which waivers or flexibilities USDA has approved for Michigan, there are two different web pages that summarize the waivers and flexibilities available. USDA has the Michigan COVID-19 waivers and flexibility site and our Michigan Department of Education website, we have the unanticipated school closures web page. Both are updated as the USDA announces approvals for waivers and flexibilities. The most recent approval was a site eligibility waiver for our unanticipated school closure sites. It waives the requirements for sites to be in areas where poor economic conditions exist. In other words, sites do not have to be in areas or a school where the free and reduced eligible population is over 50%. Here in Michigan, we have already allowed that flexibility with our first webinar on March 13th, when we told all districts that they could operate this program. That remains throughout the end of your scheduled school year. All sponsors can participate in this program. Now, I don't want anyone to think that we are taking the safety of your staff lightly. We appreciate and understand that this is an incredibly stressful time with so many counterbalancing priorities. Yesterday, we released a joint memo with the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development called Best Practices for School Food Service Providing Meals During COVID-19. It's important if you have someone on your team who has, po has tested positive for COVID-19 that you work closely with your local health department for the proper next steps, which may include changing meal preparation and distribution to a different location, if at all possible. We've also heard that some are having issues with crowd control. As is so often the case with a crisis, 
the loss of a sense of normal can swallow us and fear and despair can set in. This is not a sprint. COVID-19 is a marathon and we need to continue to work together to get through this. So please work closely with local law enforcement. Consider spreading out meal pickup to prevent congregation of crowds. Help yourself with a mind shift that moves us out of this adrenaline fueled thinking to something that is more strategic and long-term planning. The unanticipated school closure resource webpage has been updated and organized for a better customer experience. How to submit an unanticipated school closure claim in the MIND system is the newest item added to help those of you unable to catch one of the claim town halls that we offered. We have also been getting a lot of questions specific to paying food service staff during this time. Specific food service labor and other operating costs necessary to run your food service program are always allowable. Paying staff that are working to feed students during this closure would be expected. This should be no different if they are school district employees or contracted food service staff. As for paying staff that are not working during this closure, this is truly a local decision. MDE recommends that districts consult with their legal counsel and contact us for specific situations or questions that you would like additional guidance on. One of the critical pieces that MDE is tasked with doing, even during a pandemic, is maintaining program integrity. This is a critical function as it protects our state resources and the federal resources to assure that we are staying as true to the program purpose as possible. During this unprecedented time, it is important to remember that you are expected to stay true to the summer food service meal pattern. A milk, two fruits and or vegetables, a grain, and a meat or meat alternate is required to be served with each meal in order to be reimbursable. In this program, you may claim up to two meals or one meal plus one snack each day. The only restriction here is that those two meals cannot be lunch and supper. If you are an approved at-risk after-school sponsor in the CACFP program, you may also provide a third meal plus a snack. Please contact your CACFP program analyst for more information. In this program, all children are to be served these meals for free. And you should expect reimbursement for those meals to be at the free reimbursement rate. Children are not required to be present at pickup or delivery and you should not be providing meals for adults without a separate funding source. Adult meals are not an allowable component to these child nutrition programs. The method of distribution remains local choice. You may be providing drive-through or pickup service. You may be delivering meals on bus or mobile route, or it may be a combination. All are allowable and encouraged. Transportation costs to, to deliver meals is an allowable expense to your food service fund, but must be prorated if additional materials such as homework packets or technology are delivered to children at the same time. Pandemic EBT or PEBT is a brand new program made available through the Families First Coronavirus Act signed into law on March 18th. Michigan was the first state to submit a state plan for this program and we are currently awaiting USDA approval of that plan so that we can begin to distribute benefits. So what is PEBT? PEBT are benefits similar to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP or food stamps. 
These are benefits for all families with children who were receiving free or reduced meals prior to the crisis, including all children at CEP sites and all of those directly certified or certified by categorical eligibility or application at the local level. The benefit will be in the amount equivalent to the reimbursement rate for free breakfast plus free lunch multiplied by the number of days of closure per month per child. And they are expected to continue through the end of the school year. They will not be able to begin until USDA approves our plan. But once USDA approves the plan, you will be hearing more from me as to how you can promote this benefit with your families. Those already receiving SNAP benefits will see the PEBT benefit added to their bridge cards. Those not already receiving SNAP will get a bridge card in the mail that they will need to pin to indicate their consent for participation. A couple of key notes for you as you consider promoting PEBT in your district plan. These are not SNAP benefits and therefore do not have the public charge rule tied to them. However, there will be families who will still worry about their immigration status or other measures and therefore will not participate. Also, with the extreme number of unemployment cases, there are many, many, many additional families who now would be relying on free meals at school but would not receive these benefits because they were not in that financial situation prior to the pandemic. Those are families who would still be falling through the cracks if we only relied on PEBT. Meals to You is another brand new program that will assist some families in rural Michigan during this pandemic. This is a demonstration project for only 26 school districts in Michigan. It is for children eligible for free or reduced meals. Those children will receive one box every two weeks with 20 meals, 10 breakfasts and 10 lunches in the mail. Those districts eligible received an invitation from us last week. Those invited had to be closed for at least four weeks had to be buildings with 50% or higher free and reduced price lunch eligibility and had to have a USDA designation of rural. This is an extremely limited program, but is an option for those invited districts to include as a component of the plan that you need to submit. Again, it's important to recognize that there are likely many more families in need than what this program will reach as it will only reach those who were free or reduced prior to the pandemic. So as you write your plans, it's important to remember that we must all be a part of the solution. Plans should not rely on only one method of meeting the needs of the children enrolled in your school district. Our local food banks are reporting that they are serving the needs of more than four times their normal amount and may run out of food as soon as this coming weekend. Simply saying in your plan that you will refer the local food bank is not acceptable. Active and formal partnerships with a local food bank to ensure that an equivalent amount of food is provided is the expectation. If you wish to provide groceries or the equivalent to families, it's important to remember that you must have private donations to cover these costs, as that is not an allowable expense to your food service fund. In addition, as I've said before, there are many more families in need than just those enrolled as free or reduced eligible prior to the pandemic. One way to know who else may be eligible is to consider collecting free or reduced applications now so that you have those additional names. The Office of Health and Nutrition Services would like to remind sponsors to continue pulling the direct certification list to ensure students and households receive the best 
student benefits available. We also believe it is a best practice to collect and process free and reduced price household applications for eligible households in both April and May 2020. Income applications should include household income at the time the application is completed or signed and submitted. Processing an application with zero income is acceptable and does not require any additional follow-up with the household. Labor involved in printing, distributing, and processing paper or online applications is considered an allowable cost and food service funds may be used for that staff time. One of the reasons we are encouraging our school meal sponsors to collect new free and reduced price applications is to help increase site eligibility for the traditional food service, summer food service program. We can use the free and reduced price student counts compared to the building enrollment to determine which buildings are above 50% free and reduced price eligible. The second reason we are encouraging processing new free and reduced price household applications is because the new benefit may be carried over for 30 operating days into the next school year. As we do not know exactly what the next school year looks like, a 30-day carryover could really benefit many households. Soon, MDE will be releasing additional safety guidance for collecting paper products such as those free and reduced applications. I'd like to shift now to a couple additional considerations for you as you navigate through developing and submitting your plans. Your child care center can bill for MDHHS children enrolled in your center, even if they are not attending. You can bill for this care without using the allotted non-attendance hours and you can bill starting with the first day that your center was closed. This means that you can bill the regular attendance hours for those MDHHS children enrolled within your center during the emergency closure period without losing any of your allotted non-attendance billable hours for those children. You can also bill for children in GSRP and or Head Start that use wraparound ch childcare within your organization. Please visit the Disaster Relief Child Care Centers page of the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs website for the most up-to-date information. A couple of slides ago, you heard me say that our food banks are distributing an enormous amount of food and are dangerously low in inventory to continue at this pace. The Food Bank Council of Michigan has requested that the USDA allow them to enact disaster distribution methods for the Emergency Food Assistance Program, otherwise known as TFAP. Disaster TFAP is targeted toward feeding both previous and new participants during disaster situations and allows for normal data collection practices to be set aside to safely and quickly serve those in need of emergency food. Food banks will be distributing something called a quarantine box at their sites, which means these boxes may or may not meet the needs of a summer food service meal pattern. Please keep that in mind if you choose to actively work with a local food bank for your plan. And finally, for those who do not know it, the Office of Health and Nutrition Services also houses the social emotional learning and mental health professionals who provide guidance to the field on these topics. Since mental health was specifically identified in the executive order as needing to be a part of the plan you all submit, I had my team pull together some considerations to assist you with this portion of your plan. These slides will be made available to everyone after today's webinars, and we will also share these considerations with your professional organizations so you don't have to worry on losing out on these thoughts. 
So with that, we have about 10 minutes for questions and we would be happy to answer whatever questions you have put into the chat box. So Jeff asks, why can't the state simply issue a check or debit card to families for the cost of meals and let them go to the store and purchase their food, therefore eliminating the school personnel and ensuring our staff's safety? Jeff, I hear you. I know that that is a great concern. The challenge is there, it, well, there's a lot of challenges associated with that. PEBT is meant to get at some of that, but again, it will not meet the needs of all families, especially those families who would newly qualify because they've lost their jobs. And that's why we need to consider a variety of approaches when we um, build our plan that we submit to our ISDs. Marcy said, I thought we were supposed to get $4.15 for each lunch. In mind, it said $3.78. So Marcy, that's something that we can look into. We did, we did submit a waiver to be able to provide $4.15 for everyone. We have not heard back from USDA on that waiver, but I will have Wendy check into that for you. Patty and Mike ask, in regards to PEBT, will families that completed a free or reduced paper application receive those benefits? Yes, those families will be included. Every district must identify students who qualify for free or reduced meals by the complete array of options that are available for qualification. They, every district must submit that information in the Michigan Student Data System, otherwise known as MSDS. And MSDS is where we were able to pull those student names and addresses and send them to our SNAP colleagues for PEBT. So yes, even families that completed a application and qualified by application will receive those benefits. Rose asks, do CEP schools still need to collect the applications? That's a great question, Rose. You wouldn't need to collect those applications for CEP. All students in a CEP district would qualify for PEBT and none of the districts, I don't believe any of the districts that qualified for Meals to You were CEP districts. So I would say no, CEP schools would not need to collect applications. Someone says we are sticking to the summer food service plus and adding extra fruits and vegetables as our students are up to 26 year old, years old in our particular school. Is that a problem? No, that is not a problem. I cannot offer you additional reimbursement for that, those additional fruits and vegetables, but certainly that is your prerogative and you have every ability to continue to do that. You go on to say that meals are being bused to their homes and I love that and I thank you so much for all of those efforts. So Lynn asks, so we cannot get reimbursed for kids that are not labeled free and reduced now? No, that is not the case. Every child under the unanticipated school closures must be served their meals for free and you will claim at the free rate. You are not to turn away children or families who, with children who come to you, you serve everyone. Sarah says, you mentioned all schools have to have a plan to continue to provide lunches. For a charter school, can that plan include directing families to their local public school? That's a great question, Sarah. And I believe the answer from the governor's office is that you must, have, you must be actively working with the public school for that arrangement and must have something that demonstrates that active participation from all entities. Mary asks, so we need to have a formal plan approved to continue feeding students through the end of the school year. Mary, your district needs to submit a plan by the end of the month to the ISD for their continuation of learning plan and a portion of that must include meals. 
So food service doesn't necessarily have to submit that plan, but I would hope and assume that food service would be involved in developing that portion of the plan. But you do not need to have that plan approved by MDE in order to continue feeding meals. Christina says, is it safe to say that we will still distribute meals even when the families receive their PEBT cards? Yes, absolutely. PEBT is not meant to replace the meal service that you are providing because again, it's restricted to only those who qualified prior to the pandemic. So your meals will still be needed by a lot of families. Lynn says, so we cannot do guest lunches anymore and get reimbursed for them. Um, adult meals have never been allowable in this program. You've never been able to submit for adult meals. So no, you could not get reimbursed for adult meals. Dan says, if we repurpose staff from other roles, should we be paying them at the food service rate? Our contract doesn't address that. Um, Dan, that's going to be a local decision that you and your administration in conjunction with your legal counsel will need to answer. That's not something that I can answer at the state rate. Carolyn says, if you have schools in your district that operate year round, if there is no school this summer, can you continue to run the unanticipated school closure SFSP? That's a great question, Carolyn. We have asked so many times, asked the USDA for clarification on unanticipated school closures and when we go to traditional SFSP, and we don't have an answer yet. So for right now, we are telling everyone at the end of the 2019-2020 school year, whatever the scheduled end of that school year was, that's when unanticipated school closures would end and we would all have to switch over to traditional summer food service program. Now in the situation of operating year round, there may be an extended school year option. It is truly best if you call your school meals analyst to ask that question and get clarification because the last thing you want is Diane answering that question and getting it wrong. So Rose says, my connection went out for a second, what all needs to be in the plan. For the food service portion of the plan, there needs to be a demonstration of active involvement in planning for meals for eligible students. And you can read that in the governor's executive order 2020-35. The presentation will be posted as soon as these webinars are over. So please don't worry about it if you missed it. Someone says the last update of MSDS was in February. If we have additional students receiving benefits, should they be identified through the MSDS student records maintenance? Um, that's a great question that I should not be answering. So I will make sure one of my staff gets to that answer and will let you know as soon as possible. Madeline says, so if we have already been providing emergency FSF, SFSP, we don't have to submit or create a plan. You do not have to submit or create a plan for MDE. Your district, however, if you are, well, you're also, so you wouldn't be a school district. School districts have to submit a plan to their ISD. But as also, you would not need to do that, Madeline. Lynn says, we do not usually do summer feeding, so will we be reimbursed through the last day of our scheduled school year? Yes, that is correct. You will be reimbursed through the last day of your scheduled school year. Lynn also goes on to say, are we still to feed kids from other schools and claim as guests? Yes, you should be feeding all children under the age of 18 unless they are a special education population that it can be under age 26 but they should be claimed as guests or extra in that situation. So with that, I have 335 and no other questions. So I want to thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you for continuing to care for your communities and thank you for continuing to allow us to serve you. Please do let us know what additional questions you have. We are here to help you. 
Have a wonderful day and please stay safe, everyone.